If you've ever opened a book to look at dependent core rising, your first impulse was probably to close the book because it's so complex. But actually, there's some good basic lessons you can learn, even from just your first impressions. And the primary factor is ignorance. That's what starts suffering in motion. And when you replace it with knowledge, that's what cuts the chain of causes and conditions that lead to suffering. So it's good to know what kind of knowledge we're working on here. And it's knowledge of the Four Noble Truths. This is why right view is always given as the first factor in the Noble Eightfold Path. It starts with conviction in your actions, that your actions are real that they really do have results. And the quality of the results is determined by the quality of the mental state that engenders the action. It's in that context that the Four Noble Truths make sense. After all, suffering is the result of a particular mental state, or series of mental states, craving and ignorance being in primary. If mental states didn't have an impact on your life, the Four Noble Truths would make no sense. This, of course, directs us to where we have to practice. We've got to train the mind. Notice, as you move into the Four Noble Truths, each of them has a duty. Each of them is a skill to be mastered. Trying to comprehend suffering so you can let go of its cause. You develop the path so you can realize the end of suffering. Those are the duties. This is why in the Buddhist teaching there's no big controversy over sudden versus gradual awakening. The kind of knowledge we're developing here is the kind of, like any skill, it's incremental. You get more and more sensitive the more you do it. And then it finally reaches a point where you really understand. The image in the text is of the continental shelf off of India. It's a gradual slope, and then there's a sudden drop off. It's not all or nothing. The build up is important because the build up is what makes you more sensitive. Only when you're really sensitive can you have those aha moments that really do go deep into the mind, open things up, change your perspective on everything. This is why the, the Eightfold Path is not only composed of right view, but also other factors which help to increase your ability to, to know, to be aware of the mind, and to help you let go of the factors that obscure the mind. That's why one of the Buddha's terms for the path is developing and letting go. You're developing clarity of mind. You're letting go of the things that obscure and defile the mind. So that's the big important important factor in the chain of causes and conditions. The other thing that will immediately strike you if you look at dependent core risings is how many of the factors come prior to sensory contact. Things don't just begin with sensory contact. You bring a whole load of preconditions to any experience, and it's working on those preconditions that's going to make all the difference. For instance, building right off of ignorance, there's what they call fabrication. The way you breathe, if it's done in ignorance, can contribute to suffering. That's physical fabrication, verbal fabrication, the things that you tend to focus on and the way you comment on them. If it's done in ignorance, it's going to lead to suffering. Perceptions and feelings, If you create those out of ignorance, or you fabricate those out of ignorance, they're going to lead to suffering as well. This is why a large part of the, the practice is focused on that issue of perception, the way you label things, how they fit into the larger picture of your thoughts. This is why the Buddha didn't just sit people down 
and say, okay, be just in the present moment and don't think about anything else. It would often lead up to an understanding of why we're in the present moment, exactly what we're trying to train in the present moment, how to look at it. This is why there's so many analogies and images in the canon. They give you a framework for understanding what you're doing. And again, so many of those images and analogies have to do with skills. There's a skillful way to perceive. There's even a skillful way to feel. Feeling comes not only from raw data coming in from the outside, but there's an element of fabrication. An impulse, say, physical impulse comes up your nerves and your mind processes it before you're really conscious of it. So what we're trying to do as we meditate is to learn about some of these unconscious processings. And a lot of that has to do with the way you perceive things. So you can consciously train yourself to perceive things in more useful, more skillful ways. There's a series of meditations called the Guardian Meditations. And they're very helpful for getting the mind in the right mood, in the right attitude, in the right understanding as you come into the present moment. Because you'll often find as you're sitting here meditating, the problem is not with the breath, it's with the baggage you're carrying with you. So you want to open up the bags and throw out all the unnecessary weight. There's an image they have in Thailand of the, the old woman who carries around a bundle of straw, a huge bundle of straw on her back. She's bent over because she's carrying so much straw. And she says, well, someday the straw is going to come in handy. So she carries it wherever she goes. And of course, there are many other things she could be carrying, but she can't because the straw is such a huge bundle. And of course, it's pretty useless. So you want to look into your, into your baggage and see how much straw you're carrying around so you can lighten your load. Then you can replace it with better things, things that really will be useful. So the guardian meditations are a good way of sorting things out in your baggage. The first guardian meditation is recollection of the Buddha. Keeping in mind his awakening, that this is an important event. It shows that through your own efforts, true happiness can be found. And that's an important point to keep in mind, because so much of our modern culture tries to say, well, you can't have an ultimate and deathless happiness, but you can have the happiness that comes from our egg beater that also has a radio built in, or whatever. In other words, they keep you focused on what you can get out of buying their stuff, which is all pretty miserable. I don't know how many articles in The Onion are based on this. You know, the woman decide, discovers that buying that new mop did not bring the fulfillment that she thought it would bring. In other words, our culture keeps us aiming pretty low. Go for the quick fix. Go for something that doesn't require any effort or skill on your part, just money. And they dress it up, make it sound like you'll be really happy. So it's important to keep in mind that there was somebody in the past who found true happiness, and it was through his own efforts. And as he said, it wasn't because he was a special god or anything. It was simply by developing qualities of mind that we can all develop, man, woman, child. Lay or ordained. Ardency. Being resolute, being heedful. We all have these qualities to some extent. It's simply a matter of developing them. And virtue, concentration, discernment. Again, we have these to some extent. It's simply a matter of learning how to make them all around. So when you're tempted to go for the quick but short happiness, remind yourself, okay, they say that a true happiness is possible, and it can be done gain through human effort. Do you want to live your life without exploring that possibility, or do you just want to write it off? So keeping the Buddha's awakening in mind is an important perspective to bring to all of your experiences. And there are many other things that you can gain by thinking about the Buddha's life.
the sort of person he was. Or his last message, to be heedful. It's the sort of person who had already found true happiness. He didn't need to gain anything from anyone else, but he went out and he taught for all those years, walking around northern India. Wherever there was someone who was ready to be taught, ready to benefit from his teachings, he would walk there. That's the kind of person who taught this dharma, not someone who was running a retreat center and needed to bring in money. And was willing to say anything to bring in the people. But someone who was acting totally out of pure motives, pure compassion. So that's the kind of practice we're practicing here. And it's ennobling for us to practice in that same lineage. So these are good things to keep in mind, good perceptions to hold in mind, especially when you're getting discouraged or tempted to give up on the practice. Or if you think, maybe, well, maybe I'm not up to this. Remember, it's always qualities, it's qualities that everybody can develop. But we have to develop them ourselves. We can't depend on somebody outside to come and do it for us. That's the other part of the message. So it keeps you on your toes. Second guardian meditation is goodwill. You want to bring an attitude of goodwill to everybody around you. When the Buddha talks about the Brahma Viharas, it's not simply goodwill, but it means goodwill all around, without limit. And that's not easy. It doesn't come naturally to us. We tend to have goodwill for certain people and not so much for other people. But as a result, our actions very easily turn unskillful. It's very easy as to do harm for the people we don't care about who are not on our list of people who deserve to be happy. So to protect yourself from that kind of unskillful action, you've got to learn how to make your goodwill all around. And that doesn't mean just creating a cloud machine that sends out billowing clouds in all directions to hide your lack of goodwill. When you start spreading thoughts of goodwill, first you spread it to people who are easy, and then you spread it to people who are harder. Even though you don't like them, you ask yourself, why would I not want this person to be happy? After all, when people are not happy, they do miserable things. The world would be a better place if everyone could find true happiness inside, regardless of whether you like them or not, or whether they've been good or not so far. So this is a challenge to really think through why you'd want to limit your goodwill, and to remind yourself of why it's good to have goodwill for everyone. You can't act on harmful intentions if your goodwill is all around. This is why it's called a guardian meditation. The third is the contemplation of the foulness of the body. Now, a lot of people don't like this one. This is the least popular of the Buddha's meditation topics, but it's very useful. Some people say, hey, I've already got a negative body image. Why do you want me to make it even neg more negative? Well, there's healthy negative body image as well as unhealthy. Unhealthy is when you see that your body is ugly, but other people have beautiful bodies. Healthy is when you see we all have the same garbage inside ourselves. And that's helpful because it's a guardian meditation because there's so many people out there that you could feel lust for, but if you acted on it, it would really create a lot of trouble. And you need a way to guard yourself against that. So instead of every time you see a beautiful person, all the narratives and ideas and associations you have with that beauty, it's good to teach yourself other narratives, other associations. Right under the skin, what you've got, you've got all these blood vessels and nerves and blech. And as you go deeper, it gets more blech.
And what do you get out of lusting for that? What do you gain? And this goes really against the grain, which is one of the reasons why this is a meditation topic. It's really useful to reflect on over and over and over again. And John Mahabhava keeps making the point, don't count the number of times that you've reflected on the foulness of the body. Just keep doing it until it's done its job. Because after all, it's our lusting after the body that we were born. And it keeps us going. in this realm, keeps us wanting to come back, and it makes us do really stupid things. So it's a useful tool to have in your arsenal. It's a useful new set of perceptions to develop. Beautiful bodies are dangerous. Beautiful bodies are not really beautiful. What you have to do is look inside a little bit, and you see all kinds of stuff that can kill the lust if you really allow yourself to see the thing as a whole, and not just in the few parts that you tend to focus on as being attractive. Then there's finally the recollection of death. And for most people, this is pretty disturbing and depressing, but it's meant to be used in the right way. In other words, remind yourself that we've got this practice that allows us to prepare for death. Have you fully developed it? Are you really prepared? And the answer is always no. Okay, you've got work to do. This is a good antidote for laziness. There's a great sutta where the Buddha talks about eight reasons for laziness and eight reasons for being diligent. And in terms of external Conditions are the same. You can be lazy because you're feeling sick. You can be lazy because you're about to go on a trip. You can be lazy because you just recovered from an illness. You can be lazy because you haven't eaten enough. You can be lazy because you've eaten too much. But you can also use those circumstances to remind yourself, OK, I don't have much time. Like when you just recover from an illness, instead of saying, well, I'm still not quite well yet, I'd let me let me rest, you remind yourself, I could get sick again. Could, I could have a relapse, but at least now I've got some strength. Let me give the strength to the practice. If you haven't eaten enough, remind yourself, okay, the body is light. You're not spending all that time and energy digesting your food. You've got more energy now for the practice. You can sit and just be very still, very quiet. So it's your attitude that's going to make the difference between whether the circumstances you've got right now are reasons for being lazy or reasons for being diligent. When you remind yourself you don't know how much time you've got, it should stir you to action. So that when the time comes when you really do have to go, you're prepared, you're ready. You've got the concentration, you've got the power of discernment, you've got the strength of mind to deal with whatever comes your way. If you could sit around and say, please may I not die, please may I not die, well, someday you're going to have to die, no matter how much you don't want to. A wiser attitude may be, okay, please may I be ready when the time comes. May I, be, may I have the strength to deal with any difficulty that might come my way. Then you realize that's something that's in your power to work on those strengths. Draw have got the example of the Buddha. This is why these two recollections, the recollection of the Buddha and the recollection of death, go well together. He shows you how you can prepare. I mean, look at the way he died. One last trip through all the jhanas. Died without any suffering at all. It's possible for a human being. If you think that comparing yourself to the Buddha is a little bit much, a little bit too much of a stretch. Well, think about the members of the Sangha. You read the verses of the elder monks and the elder nuns, and some of them were pretty miserable. Total losers at meditation, and yet they were able to pull themselves together. They could do it, you can do it. So these are 
guardian meditations to bring the right factors. into your perception of things, the labels and the ideas that you bring to your experience. The more you develop them, the, the better set of associations, the better set of narratives you bring to, say, just the fact that you're breathing or the fact that you're seeing or hearing, tasting, touching things in the present moment. In other words, it's what you bring into the present moment that's going to make all the difference. This is why we train the mind. This is why we practice. So when the time comes to perform, you're in. You perform well. In a way that doesn't lead to suffering, you bring knowledge into the equation. So that no matter which factor of dependent core arising you're looking at, whether it's feelings or contact or craving, clinging, whatever. When you bring knowledge to that, it can untangle the conditions for suffering and replace them with conditions that lead to the end of suffering. To learn how to develop these topics as well as the breath. They help put the whole practice into the right narrative, into the right perspective. And they protect you so that you're not constantly causing suffering for yourself and the people around you. That's the best protection there is. <laughs>